So King David, so we talked about King Solomon, let's talk about King David. I want to talk to you today about victory, <clears throat> living in victory. And I've titled my message today, Unconventional Victories. I about you, but I think many times we want God to think the way that we think. We serve an unconventional God. Unconventional in our eyes, but conventional in his eyes. A God that doesn't do things the way that we want him to do them. In his time, in his season, in the way that he does them, in the way that he speaks to us about the way that he does them. Unconvention, unconventional victories. If you think about it, we've got Easter coming up. Just think about it. The cross was a symbol of shame. Yet God turned it around and made it a symbol of victory. We just serve an unconventional God. I love what the Bible says in Isaiah 55, verse 8 to 9. He says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so I guess the point today is we need to be constantly open to the leadings of the Holy Spirit in the way that God brings breakthrough the way that God speaks to us, in the small promptings of the Spirit of God, so that we can live in a season of unconventional victories. Now, there's an unconventional victory that we often speak about when we talk about David, and it's David and Goliath. And I just want to look at the moment that David actually defeated Goliath, because there's a phrase there in the Old Testament that I just believe sums up this whole idea of unconventional victories. It says this in 1 Samuel 17, verse 48. It says, As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. And reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. And so David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Look what it says in verse 50. Without a sword in his hand. The Bible makes the the distinction. Without a sword. Everyone else used the sword. But God said, David, I'm going to give you a different tool set. I mean, swords were normal. The whole of Israelite army had a sword. Goliath had a sword. God said to David, my battle plan for you is different. God had different ideas for David. David was not the normal warrior. David was not the conventional choice. We know that even his father didn't acknowledge him. His brother wrote him off. And yet when all of Israel had lined up with Goliath with their swords, think about it. He lived in a culture that they trained with swords. He lived in a culture that everyone was used to swords. If you didn't go out to war with a sword, you were stupid. You would expect to get killed. But God had a different plan for David. A plan that was not conventional. It was not normal. It was not expected but that's the way God works isn't it so why do we rely on swords why after all these years do we still rely on conventional means for God to bring breakthrough in our lives some of the greatest battles in the Bible were achieved through unconventional means with unconventional tools and unconventional ways Acts 1 8 but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Historically, in church life, one of the things that that prophecy came to pass was when they would throw the Christians into the Colosseums. And one of the reasons why the Roman governor would do that was to actually quell the faith. That if other people saw that these believers were killed for their faith, it would actually die the faith down. What he didn't realise was it was the direct opposite happened. And one of the reasons for that is, is in church history and writers back then would tell us that as the Christians were being led into the Colosseum in front of the thousands of the throngs of people, 
And they were either going to kill them with the sword or they were going to actually release the lions that will come out and maul them to death. The crowd saw these Christians where they would expect them to be filled with terror and fear and screaming because they knew that they were about to die an unimaginable death. What they saw was something completely different. They actually saw these simple people like you and I being led to the slaughter, praying for their captors. Actually having a calmness and a confidence in the face of death. And so the people in the Colosseum saw that and went, what is going on with these people that are ordinary people like you and I? And rather than freaking out and losing their mind, there was a confidence in the face of death. And they say just the reaction of the believers was the very thing that saw thousands of people give their lives to Jesus. Unconventional ways that God uses to actually spread the gospel unconventional. So I want to give you three unconventional thoughts when you're going for victory in your life. Come on, who's believing for victory this morning? So these are unconventional ideas when it comes to God, the victories that God gives us. The first one is this. When it comes to the Lord, what you have to realize is the battle is over even before it's begun. The Bible says that he didn't have a sword. I would propose to you today he didn't need a sword. He had a slingshot. But in reality, he probably didn't even need a slingshot. He could have had a piece of paper. He could have been like a Jason Bourne. (laughs) Slices off the giant's head with a piece of paper. Goliath died by a thousand paper cuts. (laughs) It actually didn't matter what David had in his hand. I find it hilarious that some preachers talk about the intricacies of the slingshot and about the stone and all of that. He just could have had anything in his hand because God was with him. And so many times when we go into battle, we think it's about what we don't have and what we do have and about being in the right season and the right place and the right time with the right people. Listen, if God has declared victory, you will have victory. And the battle is often won even before it has begun. You want some more proof in the Word of God? Well, look at, look at Joshua. Look at Joshua. Joshua 6 verse 1 to 2. Before the battle had even begun. Now Josh Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. Along with its king and its fighting men. He didn't say, I will deliver Jericho. He said, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. I want you to notice that God is speaking past tense. Even for before the battle has begun. If I was Joshua, I would have gone, have I missed something? Like, did I wake up and something happened overnight? But God is making the statement like it's a foregone conclusion, that it's not a maybe or a hopeful, but it is an established fact. And the point is this again. There's an idea in the Word of God that God has already done all the fighting and all the heavy lifting. And even though there is no sign of success and nothing has happened, the Lord says, I have delivered it into your hands. Can I challenge you this morning? Stop living by sight and start living by faith. You can't see it. Nothing is happening. It doesn't matter. God is already delivering it behind the scenes in the spiritual realm. What I find interesting with this particular scenario is that in the natural, it looks worse. Because the Bible says they were tightly shut up because of the Israelites. In other words, before they could walk freely in and out as they were spying out the land. But now it was tightly shut up. In other words, there was no opportunity. There was no sign. There was no circumstance in their favor. There was nothing. 
And because God was with them, think about this, because God was with them in the natural, it looked harder. See, what happens with you and I is when we do something that God's asked us to do, we often encounter resistance and it often looks harder. And we go, God, what are you doing? You've asked me to do this. Just like the Israelites, it was tightly shut up. It was harder because of who they were. You just can't look at the natural. I tell you what, when I see a resistance, I know it's a sign that God is going to do something supernatural. Rather than me looking at the resistance and going, this is harder now, and this is more difficult, and now the enemy is one, I look at resistance as something that God is just going to give me the blessing and the favour. I'm about you. I mean, David talks about this. He says, I run towards a wall. You know, David just had a natural ability, a desire, a faith desire to always run towards difficult things. I'm not talking about stupidity. I'm just talking about something within you that when God has spoken to you, you're going to run after that thing because you know that behind the scenes that God is going to bring breakthrough. Just maybe you are effective and that's why life is hard. Maybe right now you're facing resistance. And maybe the very reason you're facing that resistance is because you are actually effective. That's prophetic for someone right now. Maybe right now things are hard and it's not because you failed, because, but because you are right in the plan and the purpose of God for your life. Maybe you were born many years ago for this season of COVID to lead the church through incredible breakthrough. I believe this is going to be the church's finest hour. It was tightly shut up because of who they were and because of the plan and the purpose of God for their life. The battle has already been won. Stop living in this season of going, it's an unsure victory. It hasn't, the fact that it hasn't happened, it doesn't mean a single thing. There are things that I'm already speaking to the being that I know that God has already established that battle. He's already won the battle. I'm just waiting for the time to walk into it. Unconventional. The second one is this. David was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He actually shouldn't have even been there. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 28. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom you should leave these few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. This is a classic sibling response. Now what have I done, David? I can't even speak. You know, when my kids were growing up, they still do it every now and then, and we'd be driving to, to church in the back seat of the car, and I'm the pastor of the church, <laughs> and my kids are fighting. Don't speak to me. Don't touch me. Don't breathe on me. <laughs> There's a war going on in the back seat, and I'm going, be quiet, we're getting to church. <laughs> There's this World War Three happening, <laughs> and the moment we rock up to church, we jump out, hey, how you going? Good to see you. <laughs> You guys are all laughing because you've been there. <laughs> God is good. Our family's so holy. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Get back in the car, you bunch of mongrels. Sort this out. <laughs> David was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Unconventional timing. Yet he was there in God's time. Didn't matter what people said. Didn't matter what people perceived. He didn't back down. And, and what I love about this, it just, David landed in that place. 
there was no leadership now in him to arrive at that place. He didn't know Goliath was there. It's like he just landed in that place. He didn't have an agenda on that day to be a giant killer. He was just obedient. He was obedient to his dad. He was soft-hearted. He was just doing what he'd always done. And who would have ever thought on that morning when he woke up that his whole life was about to change? Look what the Bible says in Psalm 105, verse 42 to 45. For he remembered his holy promise given to his servant Abraham. And he brought out his people with rejoicing. He chose his chosen ones with shouts of joy. He gave them the lands of the nations. They fell heir to what others had toiled for, that they might keep his precepts and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. I love that. They just fell heir. They just stumbled into their promise. They weren't even looking for it and going for it. What other people had toiled with all of their leadership now and all of their analytical brains, the Israelites just fell into. Listen, can you believe that you can just fall in, similar to what I said last, uh, last session, can you just believe that you can just fall into the promises of God? The wrong place at the wrong time. When it should not be happening, God brings breakthrough. I've been amazed in COVID where people have been at their lowest, God has brought breakthrough. And I said this to my church the other day. One of the reasons why God does that is if you have breakthrough at the mountaintop, it all becomes about you and your leadership and your skill set. But you know it is God. When you are going through a valley and everything's tough and for some reason the blessing and the favor of God is there. The wrong place at the wrong time. In the most unexpected ways, God brings incredible victory. Incredible victory. Um, So I was born in Melbourne and then I was born in Fentry Gully Hospital and then was in the Baptist church that I talked to you about. We went to Adelaide. We pioneered a church over there. Complete disaster. Nothing worked. Right? We had no idea what we were doing. Right? I pulled out my guitar because I used to play guitar and I'd stand up in front of the pub and I'd start playing this little lad of mine and I'm going to let it shine. Because I'd heard stories of old of how people did that and a revival swept the land. <laughs> so I'm going to have a crack because God's going to do that. I even heard a story that Reinhard Bonnke did that. I don't know if that was true or not, but I grabbed hold of that. Started playing outside a pub. People walk out, hey, yo, mate. God loves you. I love you too. I love you too. Love you. <laughs> My ministry journey has been all over the place. You know. And we get involved at Paradise and we served there and we took over the, the youth group or the young adults from Russell as they came over here, planted at, at uh, uh, Shakers. And then about five, six years into that, helped the senior pastor. Pastor Ashley continued to pastor the church. Now that Russell's gone, he needed someone else just to help him. And so we did that for a number of years. And then God started to speak to me about the next season. It was the wrong time. Because things were going well. We were happy where we were. And God started to speak to me. And so I started to get stirred to go on a fast. And so I went on a 40-day fast. It's something that I used to do years ago when I was younger and uh, really felt that was the next season for me. I started to fast and pray. Near the end of my fast, I had a dream three nights in a row. I had a dream that I was working with a white-haired man. And the first dream was that I was working with a white-haired man in in a motel, and we were doing up a motel. It was an old motel. It was one of those ones with, uh, you know, weatherboard, and we were painting it. Wake up, the, 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 the next dream was uh, that I was now working in a, in a house with him, an old house. Painting the house up and doing all the... Fr- I remember all the fret work and getting all, all that right. And the third dream was, was another house. So I woke up three nights in a row, I'm going, who is this white-haired man? So I started just driving through Adelaide looking for white-haired men. <laughs> no, 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 no. But God was birthing something within me. 
few months after that, we, uh, um, God started to speak to me about stepping out in faith. And he said, I want you to resign from your position. Wrong place, wrong time. Mate, everything's going well. I don't want to shift. So I want you to resign. And I'm, you know, my cultural background is that I'm pretty black and white. Right? Works for me in most situations, sometimes it doesn't. But God speaks to me black and white. He goes, if you preach about faith, why don't you start operating in faith? <laughs> so I went to my senior minister and I said, look, we fear, and I've been, I'd, he'd been on this journey with me. And I said, look, you know, I, I, I didn't tell him about the dream, but I said, I really feel this is the next season for us. We need to resign. He said, what are you going to go to? I said, I've got no idea. So I put in my notice. And God spoke to me out of Abraham and Isaac. I said, I need a word. I need a word if I'm going to do this. And about how Abraham walked the journey of faith, walked up the mountain. And it's only when he got to the top, he saw the ram caught in the thicket. And he said to me, God said, you want to see the provision at the bottom of the mountain. You're never going to see the provision at the bottom. You're only going to see the provision when you start walking the journey of faith. And so that was the confirming word. And so we resigned. We're going to finish at a particular time. It was around that time, it was probably about three months later, that we had a state conference in Adelaide. And Pastor Alan Davies was the speaker. So someone asked me to pick him up. Right? Now, I did Harvest Bible College years and years ago, back in the mid-'80s. So I actually didn't remember him until that point. I picked him up. He jumped in my car. I looked at him, and I thought, you're the white-haired man in my dream. <laughs> Now, whenever God does that to you, don't be stupid. Because I didn't say to him, I've been dreaming about you. <laughs> that would have been weird, right? That would have been just really weird. And so, he did his thing and he said, let's go out for coffee and I want to hang out with him and just pick his brains and sat down, had, had a coffee, and uh, he said, oh, I heard that you resigned. And I said, yeah, yeah, I did. And he goes, hmm. He said, God spoke to me about you two years ago. But, he said, to the, but he, said, I said to the Lord, I'm not going to take another man's man. You have to speak to him about finishing up, and then I'll have a conversation with him. Unconventional victories. They come at the wrong place at the wrong time but they are always in the will of God you're confident in the leadings of the Holy Spirit when it is not the right time when you feel like you are in the wrong place because God is not bound by time and space he's not bound by your place he's not bound by what goes on in our little brains he does what he does The third one is this, is that David was just unconventional, just unconventional people. God uses unconventional people. So he goes out to battle and look what they try and put on him. Samuel chapter 17 verse 38. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armour on him and a bronze helmet on his head. And David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he had not used them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. The reality is David didn't fit. He just didn't fit with his family. He didn't fit with the army. He didn't even fit with the clothes that King Saul was giving him. He didn't fit the mold. He didn't fit the battle. He didn't fit. And what I love is this powerful statement. Rather than conforming, he said, I can't go in these because I'm not used to them. Can I say this as a spiritual encouragement? Stop conforming to the patterns of the world. You and I are not meant to fit. We're not meant to be a perfect fit. When we gave our lives to Jesus, everything changed around us. Our culture changed. Our attitudes changed. Our morality changed. Why do we have such a desire to fit in? 
In other words, he says, they'll slow me down. If we spent less time trying to fit and more time in, try, time in being obedient, we defeat more, we conquer more, we get ahead more. I've never felt that I fit. Grew up in an ethnic home. Mum and dad German. Even the food they gave me for lunch didn't fit the Aussie food. <laughs> My mum used to give me salami sandwiches. The school could smell me a mile off when I'd rock up to them. <laughs> My mum wouldn't slice the salami, she'd hack the salami. Big fat pieces of salami. Everyone else was having their Vegemite sandwiches and their fairy bed. <laughs> and there's the German boy in the background having his big fat salami sandwiches. Here comes Heinze, we can smell him a mile away. <laughs> Never felt I fitted at school. For my time in Harvest when I was in, in college, well actually after my time in Harvest, I went, when I was in Adelaide, I went to another college. It got to the end of my, my course. I met with a bunch, a couple of the lecturers and, you know, I was very shy and wasn't great with people and there's a part of me that's actually an introvert. You know, I struggle to do these things. And so I sat with the lecturer and they said, what do you want to do? What's the next season for you? And I said, well, you know, I was 18 back then. Oh, I really would like to be in ministry. They looked at me and they said, well, we, we don't think you've got it. You know, you're not confident and we just don't think you've got it. So even my Bible college lecturer didn't believe I should be in ministry. <laughs> He said, I want you to just go out and get a normal job. Didn't fit in college. So many moments in life that I just didn't feel I fit. And sooner or later, God began to speak to me. He said something so powerful to me in the early days of my ministry. He said, Matt, fitting in is overrated. People that have done anything for God have never really fit. It's just the way that God works. So rather than it being a source of insecurity, just maybe it's a source of confirmation that you are in the will of God for what God wants you to do. I understand as churches we have to be relevant. I understand as churches that we have to be seeker friendly. But as never, let us never ever cross the line but we are trying so hard to fit in that we are losing our anointing and we are losing our ability to be different in the world. We are salt and light. I want people to come into my church and not go, wow, that felt like a nightclub. I want to come into my church and then go, yeah, there was something I felt there. What was that? That was the touch of God. Is that karma? No. It's called the Holy Spirit. I want people to be impacted by the power of God. I had a meeting with a politician the other day. He goes, I want to come check out your church. I said, it's not going to be like any normal church. And I freaked him out. I said, you better put on your dancing shoes. He goes, what does that mean? I said, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I love the fact that we don't fit in the world. I love the fact that people come in. I think sometimes... We're trying to explain the Holy Spirit away. We feel like we have to explain everything. What about people just coming in and experiencing the pure power of God and getting prophetic words and releasing God's anointing and people walking away completely impacted by the power of God? You and I were never, ever meant to fit. And David was just obedient to his father. He was obedient to the Lord. And even though he didn't feel he fitted, he just stepped into what God had for him. Rather than getting your arm and your battle dress from someone else, get it from the Lord. Get it from the Lord. I think the last one is this, is it was David's unconventional focus. Because of his devotion to God, there was just a focus that David just clipped into. And it was the focus that he had learnt behind the scenes. 
If you build your devotion behind the scenes, one day your devotion will serve you in the big battles of life. There are years that you serve your devotion, but there will come a day that your devotion will serve you. And I think with David, his devotion served him in the day that he battled Goliath. Because that focus and that sharpness and that development he'd learned with the lion and the bear and all the battles behind the scenes, he'd sharpened his devotion. Then came a day that that devotion served him. And this is the thing with him and Goliath, and this is really my final idea, is that it was that one battle that set David up for the rest of his life. That one battle that shifted everything for him. That one battle. I do believe that you and I throughout our life have maybe have two or three significant battles. Maybe they're battles of confidence. Maybe they're battles of stepping up to more responsibility, whatever they are. But if we understand that God does things in an unconventional way and we don't back off and we don't allow the enemy to put fear in our lives and go, oh, it's the wrong place and the wrong time and I'm the wrong person. We miss out on the opportunity to step up to the plate and be the person that God has called us to be. I'm not worried about a lack of opportunity. I know it will come my way, but I want to make sure that I'm ready, that I'm ready to step up to what God has for me. God does unconventional victories in unconventional ways. Can I pray that this year will be a year of great victory for you personally? Hopefully, even as I've been preaching, God has just eroded away some of the lack of confidence and some of the inability in your own heart to think, oh, you know, I'm not that right person. If you don't fit, you're in the right place. You don't fit, you're in the right place. God says, I can choose you. I can work with you. You fit too comfortably, he can't use you. But that agitation, that ag- can I be really honest? I, I honour the role that I'm in as a state president, but it's the last thing that I ever wanted to do because I've never felt that I fit. And God keeps saying, well, that's, that's why you're in that. That's why you're in that position. Yeah. Our generation doesn't care about titles. We just care about making a difference. Just care about making a difference. But I pray, let's pray that this year for you will be a year not of small victories, but of big, big victories. Of big victories. God is going to shift big things. Father God, right now,